Zotka 3 to this is Zotka 3 to 9, let's go. Bouray. Sector East in the UN established buffer zone between Ethiopia and Eritrea, the place where demarcation of the border should have started almost two years ago. Two years later, the UN mission in Ethiopia and Eritrea continues to wait for a solution to a protracted stalemate on the road to demarcation. To find out how we arrived at where we are today, let's take you back to December 2002, where we last left the next steps in the peace process. December 2002. The mood in Ethiopia and Eritrea is one of anticipation, as the UN mission in Ethiopia and Eritrea, the rest of the world, and most importantly, the people of both countries, await the schedule of the Eritrea-Ethiopia Boundary Commission that will usher in the final phase of the peace process, the demarcation of the border. Scheduled to begin in July 2003 and postponed twice, this crucial phase of the peace process would have marked the logical completion of UNMI's mandate. However, as December 2002 dawns, it appears that demarcation is no closer to becoming a reality. The year 2003 begins on a note of cautious optimism. Shuttle diplomacy by the head of the mission between the two capitals takes on greater significance from late 2002 and throughout most of 2003, constantly encouraging Ethiopia and Eritrea to get on with the job of demarcating the border and regularly reminding them of their responsibilities under the Algiers Agreement to implement the final and binding decision of the Boundary Commission. All I was trying to do was to encourage the parties to get on with the job of demarcating the border. Uh, and I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, pretending that uh, I could negotiate with any of the two parties on behalf of the EDC. The demarcation of the border is the responsibility of the EDC, not of the special representative. After months of speculation, the EEBC finally publishes its Order of Activities, which sets out a step-by-step -step implementation of the demarcation plan. That's envisaged to begin in late July 2003 and end in July 2004. For many, this is a good sign. However, on September the 20th, 2003, the first definite sign of trouble emerges. Ethiopia's Prime Minister writes a letter to the United Nations Security Council on the 19th of September 2003, officially rejecting some parts of the decision of the Boundary Commission. The anticipated border demarcation appears to move further away from becoming a reality. Tension between the two countries rises and the peace process begins to drift towards a stalemate. What caused the cautious optimism on which the year 2003 began to turn into frustration caused by a protracted stalemate that threatens peace between the two neighbouring countries and more significantly, peace in the Horn of Africa? Well, it's well known that uh, on the 13th of April 2002, the decision of the Boundary Commission was rendered by the EBC and immediately the two parties accepted it. And then later, one of them, Ethiopia, changed its mind on a very important part of the line of delimitation, uh, what is called the 15% of the line of delimitation central sec in the central sector, Europe, and uh, the western sector, Badde. And that is the reason where we are where we are uh, in a statement. Is there anything that could have been done differently to avoid the impasse? Well, I think the international community, but in particular the guarantors of the peace process, the four signatories to the peace agreement of December 12th, should have uh, realized that uh, if they didn't uh, keep uh, the, uh, the parties on track after accepting the decision of the Boundary Commission, there was always the possibility that one of them was going to dislike some part of the decision of the Boundary Commission. It's nothing to do with the force, the implementation of the, of the Boundary Commission's decision. Um, it, that's entirely to do with, between the Boundary Commission 
and the, the parties themselves. Uh, and that is the process that has come unstuck at the moment. Um, militarily, I think uh, UNMI has been a very successful operation and remains a successful operation. Um, the only difficulty people have now is how long does uh, this military operation have to be sustained uh, given that it's an expensive operation. And I suspect that um, the international community's patience is not endless uh, in terms of, of, of funding uh, the human resources and the treasure needed uh, to keep this peace process going or to keep the military stability going if the two parties themselves aren't prepared uh, to compromise or get into dialogue. Ethiopia's position on demarcation ushers in a period in the journey to demarcation that's fraught with challenges and frustrations in an environment in which it becomes increasingly difficult for the mission to operate. With frequent restrictions on freedom of movement imposed by both parties at different times on UNMI's military and civilian personnel, coupled with the absence of political dialogue between the parties, the year 2003 proves particularly difficult for UNMI. It was a year of, of uh, great frustration for all of us because suddenly it dawned on us that uh, the border was not going to be demarcated as planned because Ethiopia in 2003 finally and officially informed the United Nations that uh, uh, it was not going to cooperate uh, with the Boundary Commission in the demarcation of the border as is uh, and that uh, they uh, uh, they, uh, they wanted the international community to help them <coughs> negotiate the 15% the 15 of the line of delimitation, which means initiate dialogue, not dialogue between Ethiopia and the international community, but dialogue between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Because these are the two parties who, in the final analysis, have to have a border acceptable to both if they are to live in peace with one another. While a solution to the problem of implementing the decision of the Boundary Commission is being sought, UNMI continues to maintain the integrity of the Temporary Security Zone, or TSZ, and keeps the parties calm. One of the mechanisms which ensures that incidents that may occur within the TSZ or its adjacent areas are resolved to the mutual satisfaction of both parties before they escalate into more serious conflicts is the Military Coordination Commission. Since its inception on the 2nd of December 2000, the Military Coordination Commission has been absolutely vital as the only available platform where the two parties can meet and discuss issues of mutual concern. The, the Military Coordination Committee is the only forum currently, the only official forum, uh, where the two parties can get together and discuss um, their differences. It's limited, of course, in its mandate to discuss only military issues, but it's profoundly helpful um, that those military issues are discussed. The MCC is not um, an UNMI organisation, it is a joint organisation of the two parties and UNMI working together. So every member of the MCC has a responsibility, a joint responsibility, for ensuring that there is that stability which we need in the border areas to allow a political process um, to progress in a stable environment. Among the notable contributions of the UNMI force to facilitating reconciliation in 2003 is what is considered at the time controversial, the Operation Rest in Peace, in which the war dead of one country are returned to the other and to their families for burial. Let me close by expressing the hope of all those present uh, that these soldiers may at long last rest in peace and that their mothers, fathers, spouses, and children may visit their graves and thereby achieve a peace of their own. As a soldier, it's always um, 
um, it's, it's a duty and a, a responsibility to, to deal with um, war dead. Um, it's within the Geneva Convention that both sides should have dealt in the past uh, with, e with each other's war dead. And uh, we had to remind them of those responsibilities. I think the fact that it was done uh, in a wholehearted way uh, and a successful way, uh, notwithstanding the subsequent political messages that were inadvertently passed or I think ill-advisedly passed, um, I think those soldiers on the ground at right up to divisional level on both sides were profoundly grateful for, for the efforts uh, mainly of my Kenyan soldiers um, who had a most unenviable task but did it with dignity and grace and a, a great sense of military honour. So I think there was a degree of reconciliation. It's taken a bit of time for both sides to realise this um, but I can say that in a, a recent uh, military committee meeting we had uh, there was a recognition um, by both sides of the contribution of each other in that process and most importantly of UNMI's contribution. So it was a small step, it was an important step uh, but as ever I, I think uh, it's a step that had to be made. How are you? The end of 2003 sees the UNMI force continuing to work with both parties to carry out its mandate of monitoring the separation of the redeployed forces of Ethiopia and Eritrea and maintaining the integrity of the TSZ. Among the important achievements of the year 2003 is the decision to establish the military coordination commissions in each sector of the mission. Ever present in the field, General Gordon regularly receives briefings from the Senior Sector UN Military Observers, or SS UNMOs, and issues guidelines which enable the force to carry out its mandated tasks of conducting challenge inspections at militia army outposts on both sides of the border, as well as investigate incidents and violations of the TSZ. On the 23rd of July 2004, and for the third time since it was established, the leadership of UNMI force changes hands in an impressive ceremony that takes place at the Adigwadad Parade Grounds in Asmara, Eritrea. On assuming office as the third UNMI force commander, Major General Rajender Singh, at his maiden press conference, affirms his determination to do his bit to ensure that the peace process succeeds. Uh, we cannot afford to fail. Uh, I am uh, therefore, uh, it will be the endeavor of my force and myself uh, to work with uh, full sincerity and dedication. Under the leadership of Major General Rajender Singh, the UNMI force has had to rise to a number of daunting challenges. The additional troops close to borders always cause certain amount of concern uh, and therefore I consider this as one of the major challenges. Despite these challenges however, the UNMI force has to its credit a number of achievements which have gone a long way in facilitating the peace process. I do not uh, uh, undermine or, or underestimate the kind of challenges that we have today. Uh, however, I would uh, like to mention that uh, we have made our plans uh, to ensure that uh, we contribute significantly as and when the demarcation process starts. Our job would only not be to uh, create stability, ensure that the peaceful environment remains, but would also be to assist the, uh, assist the EBC in the demarcation process. In mid-August 2002, UNMI's mandate is adjusted to reflect this additional task of supporting the work of the Eritrea-Ethiopia Boundary Commission as it moves towards demarcation by providing assistance with demining in many of the mine-infested areas, leading to the sites where the pillars will eventually be emplaced in preparation for the demarcation process to begin. Well, the major effort of the MAC was to ensure the integration of the military and civilian mine action assets in the force. And to this end, we have created a first for 
United Nations peacekeeping missions in that we now have a fully integrated military civilian force mine action centre. And that has enabled us to utilise both military and uh, civilian demining assets cost effectively, efficiently and with great productivity. With an estimated 250,000 landmines and 3 million unexploded ordnances spread across Eritrea as a result of its history of national struggle, the task facing the UNMIMAC remains enormous. One of the important benefits of humanitarian demining on the road to demarcation is that it allows for the delivery of much needed humanitarian assistance by UNMI to those who live in the rural areas. His right eye can still be saved. Okay. His left eye, it, I don't think it is possible because the cornea has gone bad now. Among the untold success stories of the UN mission in Ethiopia and Eritrea is the contribution of the contingents within the force to alleviating the suffering of the needy who live in the rural areas as the journey on the road to demarcation continues. Through its civil military cooperation, also known as CIMIC, and also its quick impact projects, known as QUIPS, UNMI assists the needy populations on both sides of the border. Because of the war, the hospital has been completely destroyed. And there is no other place for the providing medication for the people. So it, it is required or it is a must to remove this completely the muck and uh, make a provision for construction of a new one. Angela Kane was the deputy SRSG in Asmara from January 2003 to August 2004. She describes the type of projects that are usually chosen for implementation. Most of our projects are in fact in water resources, uh, they are in rehabilitating schools that might have been destroyed in the fighting, they are in rehabilitating uh, hospitals which are also very badly needed. Uh, we've also purchased medication for the medical camps like the one that we are witnessing here today because we feel that health, water, schooling, education and good health is really what is most needed for the population. In fact, uh, operation that we call Winning Hearts. This operation we have launched with three aims in view. First and foremost is to create a peace constituency in the area by creation of goodwill, bringing in certain amount of normalcy in the area. The second is to create goodwill in public towards the peacekeepers, which would further lead to greater acceptability. And the third aim of this is to create an immediate impact on the population to ensure that we get greater cooperation from them. <laughs> 